Hi, thanks everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Okay, so today we will we have with us um, Charu, who is our market strategist based in Singapore. And for myself, I'm Kaylee, a relationship manager with Sexo. So before we start on this macro and market updates, um, I'd like to, of course, share a brief introduction of Charu. Um, she has over 12 years of experience in the finance industry across the equity and macroeconomic space, covering global and Asian markets. At Sexo, she focuses on delivering investment strategies based on global macroeconomic analysis and monetary policy developments. Before we officially start, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a chat function available for any questions you may have. And Charu will address these questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let me invite Charu to kick off the session. Thank you, Kaylee, for that very kind intro and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Saxo's Macro and Markets Update. And I'll just uh, share my slides. Okay, I hope you can see the slides now. Um, just to introduce the topic in more detail, um, we think panic is likely to build further from here in the macro space as well as in the markets particularly, of course, that's more important. Um, we haven't seen the bottom yet in the markets and H2, um, the second half of the year, will uh, likely bring more shocks on the macro side and as a result uh, to the markets. And that's why I say as the panic builds. Uh, so let me just start with a disclaimer. Um, all trading carries risks and any comments made on this webinar today should not be considered as financial or investment advice. Okay, that's the agenda that we'll be, we will be uh, following for today. Um, I will first start off with a brief uh, you know, outlook on the US macro side and talk about the US markets as well. Uh, then we will go on to the global uh, discussion and talk more in detail about um, uh, Europe as well as Japan and China. Um, and eventually, we'll move on to a topic called dynamics of a new world where we discuss how 2022 has brought new challenges for the markets amid the war in Ukraine and the resulting inflation pressures um, and what H2 would bring where we stand in the inflationist versus the recessionist argument um, and then we go on to uh, what you should consider while making your trading or investment decisions from here. I'm sure that's the most relevant part. And finally, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, we will end the session with the Q&A. Uh, but of course, um, please feel free to send your questions in the chat box, uh, even when um, I am presenting. Uh, so that will give us um, a, a number of questions at the end, and then I can take it from there. Okay, so um, let's start with the U.S. macro and markets. Um, um, so what I what I've been talking uh, to clients about uh, in terms of the U.S. Uh, situation particularly is that there's this tug of war going on right now uh, where of course we um, you know from November we've been seeing this argument about uh, inflation uh, but uh, now we are at a point where we think that the Fed uh, you know is going to tighten and is possibly going to be a policy mistake uh, and that will lead to um, a lot of uh, demand destruction and possibly a recession uh, so last few weeks the most common question we've seen um, from clients and from media is if we see a recession coming and if, if the, that will make the Fed uh, pivot. Um, focus point here obviously being the US economy where inflation is above 8%. Uh, remember that we come from a point where central banks said until November that inflation is transitory. So of course this is a big shock and um, you know we are in this camp where, which believes that inflation will be higher for longer. It may be peaking soon or it may have already peaked, I don't know. But the true test is how steeply it comes back down and how low it can go uh, when it starts to revert. I mean, do, do we really think that inflation will go back to the 2% levels uh, that we've been used to in the US or that the Fed is still targeting, actually? I mean, they're still saying that they want to bring inflation back down to 2% levels. I doubt that is possible. So central bankers, um, you know, they have kind of um, still peddling with the idea that 2% uh, inflation is possible in the 18-month horizon. Uh, well, that would mean 
a, a lot of demand destruction and um, potentially I don't see the Fed going to that extent uh, to be able to cause that much of a pain to the economy. Um, I mean, of course, how much can you trust the central banks, which in November was saying that inflation uh, is transitory and now they are all um, out in fighting this uh, fighting this problem. Uh, so, so yeah, I would, I would place little trust on that um, expectation. Uh, but of course, something uh, worth noting is that inflation expectations are rising. Um, you can see uh, the second round inflationary effects coming through as well, uh, which means that central banks will have to continue to tighten more than what the markets currently expect them to. Um, will that mean we see a recession in the US? Um, so Q1 GDP has been negative. In fact, it was last night itself, it was revised further lower to minus 1.6%. Um, and uh, some of the Fed models have kind of hinted at Q2 GDP being uh, flat earlier, which they've now revised higher to 0.3%. But uh, of course, there's a risk that it turns negative, And that would mean a technical recession, two quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. But the expectations of a softness in uh, Q2 GDP are so far. Um, let me just uh, focus here a bit on survey data, which is, you know, the Fed does a lot of these surveys, you know, which is, uh, you know, just ask a few questions. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, we think that this survey data is high, hardly reliable. Uh, two reasons, of course, um, the the number of the, the, the people that are targeted in this uh, survey are, are quite less and it's hard to map that out to the entire population and uh, secondly also uh, within the surveys there has been a divergence so if you look at the University of Michigan survey uh, for June it dropped to a record low of 50.2 from 58.4 in the month before uh, with both the expectations index and the current index being uh, really weak uh, but again now uh, if you look at the questions that go into this survey they mainly focus on inflation and cost of living dynamics, uh, which of course is hitting the consumer now, especially with the increases that we are seeing in the gasoline prices. Uh, but does that mean that the real activity data is also weak? Um, we haven't seen any convincing signs of that yet. Uh, there are pockets of weaknesses, for, for example, in housing, I won't deny that. But um, isn't that the whole idea of like Fed um, going for tightening, they have to kind of bring down demand to bring the markets in balance again, right? So, of course, I mean, there will be um, a slowdown. We cannot discount the fact there. Uh, but let me tell you how National Bureau of Economic Research defines a recession. Uh, they say that a recession is a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months. Uh, so uh, they have also indicated uh, that the that the metrics that you should be looking at when you are calling a recession should be real personal income, non-farm payroll employment, real personal consumption expenditures, wholesale retail sales, uh, and employment is measured by the household survey as well as industrial production. So that really is um, a very a broad based uh, weakness has to come across the drivers of the economy to call it a recession. Uh, so again, I mean, we haven't seen that so far in the US data and uh, we uh, we don't think that it will happen to an extent where we can call it a recession. There will be a slowdown, but we believe the markets are far ahead in pricing in a recession and the only news that we can get on this will be positive. And um, the bottom here, I also show a chart on copper to gold ratio. It is seeing, seeing a sharp downturn in the recent weeks, again signaling that how far the market is pricing the recession. It's a key recession indicator particularly. So this chart is actually calling for 10-year yields to turn lower, uh, which is, uh, again, I mean, just a signal that uh, markets are running ahead of itself without real activity data uh, pointing towards uh, any big concerns. Okay. Uh, the other key question that we usually get from clients, um, have the markets bottom, bottomed out? So, uh, of course, we've seen a reversal recently after U.S. equities entered bear markets earlier in June. Uh, the reversal is because of quarter-end quarter portfolio rebalancing. Um, and also, like I said, because of this dilemma between inflation and recession fears, I think investors are still, uh, you know, uh, trying to decide which way to tilt towards and, you know, what recession fears and 
fact, markets have gone ahead to the point of actually expecting rate cuts from the Fed next year. Um, um, so, so I mean, uh, that is kind of helping to build some momentum in the equities recently. Uh, but again, I, um, uh, you know, as at Saxo, we believe that there is further downside in the equities. Uh, so there's two things when you consider equities. One, of course, is the earnings and the other is valuations. Um, if you look in, uh, look at the um, uh, S&P 500 and take its one year forward PE ratio, as of mid-June, it was around 16 times. That's down from 21 times at the beginning of the year. Uh, but the median multiple since 1990 has been 15.4. Uh, so given that we are in a down cycle where the Fed is tightening, withdrawing liquidity from the markets, and it's at a rapid pace, you know, consider that the pace of Fed tightening is unprecedented. The Fed has already hiked by 150 basis points in the last three meetings. Uh, the market is actually pricing in another two, 200 basis points of tightening uh, for the 2022 calendar year. Uh, that would mean in total 350 basis points in a brief space of a few months. And um, uh, along with that, of course, we also have quantitative tightening going on, which is uh, taking out a lot of liquidity from the markets. The Fed has not moved at this pace since the early 80s. Uh, so, um, uh, given all this risk, that, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to believe that uh, businesses will so slow down their expansion plans, and um, so that makes me think that it is probably more justified for the S and P to be priced lower to its historical average, at least. Um, so, so that's that's the uh, that's the valuation point of view. But if you look at the earnings uh, side of things, also. Uh, throughout the quarter, actually, companies have faced uh, higher energy co uh, costs, and you know, despite some recent respite in energy prices, um, the the overall trend for the quarter for the energy prices has been uh, quite disturbing. But along with that, also wage pressures have been increasing, supply issues haven't resolved really, and uh, consumer dem demand has been dampened because of the fear of tightening um, uh, of liquidity. Uh, um, but if you look at earnings estimates for Q2 and for 2022, still very optimistic. Uh, there are some charts here on, on the right side. Uh, the red and green ones are from FactSet, which estimates that 4.3% uh, earnings growth uh, for S&P 500 in Q2. It is the lowest since Q4 2020, but still quite high. I think after most companies, specifically if you if you heard the Q1 earnings calls, most companies guided for more cost pressures. Uh, and of course, I mean, since Q1, we've also seen some amount of demand destruction, uh, which would make it difficult for companies to pass on these higher costs as well to uh, the retail prices. Um, so despite higher inflation, rising interest rates, there's a conflict going on in Ukraine still, which does not, uh, you know, a kind of look at um, look look uh, like it's nearing its end as well. There's a fear of recession, stock price declines, but analysts continue to have an unusually high number of buy ratings on stocks in the S&P 500. Um, so more S&P 500 companies have issued negative EPS guidance for Q2 compared to recent quarters. Um, there are a total of 103 companies that have issued guidance and out of that, 72 have issued negative EPS guidance. So that's 70% of the companies. Um, so this is the highest number that, uh, you know, we've seen uh, since Q4 2019. Most of them are in the utilities or the consumer discretionary space. Um, but once Q2 um, company earnings and downgrades for the year come in, the market is likely to be disappointed and possibly head lower again while also grappling with again tighter liquidity so q2 earnings will start from the third week of july and i do see that as being a real pain point for the equity markets in particular if you look at the top left chart here the blue and the black one the 20 percent decline in the snp that we've seen this year has been because of the drop in the PE multiple. So basically that's called a multiple compression. Uh, the decline in uh, PE uh, is obviously because we've seen the 10-year yields rising and you can see the correlation to that so well uh, in this chart as well. It's on the reverse scale, of course, but uh, yeah, as, as yields are rising, uh, PE is falling down. Uh, but even if we don't see yields going up much from here, uh, you know, given the fears of a slowdown or a recession, whatever you want to call it, um, the downward earnings revision that I've been talking about will be the next 
issue that the um, S&P companies need to handle, and that will track the market lower from here. So you see, both the parts of the PE are actually going to be moving. I mean, we've seen the movement in the uh, in the in the multiples, and now is the time to kind of see the movement in the earnings, which, in in my view, is going to be really the next shoe to drop on the markets. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I turn now to the global macro picture, uh, where um, you know we are seeing actually very similar uh, problems in um, most of the developed markets. Uh, you know, growth is slowing, inflation is running hot. In fact, more hot than what we are seeing in the US, especially in Europe, uh, and. Again, the central banks have taken too long to kind of acknowledge that inflation is more than just transitory. Um, Europe is now facing this double whammy of uh, Russia's gas supplies being cut off. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's a supply issue. But at the same time, uh, so many years now, they've been focusing on green transition, uh, which has meant that they retired their fossil fuel plants without making sure that green energy can meet their, de meet their demands. Um, so again, that means there's been some kind of an underinvestment. Um, they are trying to go back to coal and stuff now. Germany has announced some plans. Uh, but again, what that means to me is that higher energy costs are here to stay. Uh, and they are going to continue to trouble the central banks for much longer. Um, ECB hasn't even started tightening yet. Um, and policy framework for uh, the European Central Bank isn't really as straightforward as it is for most of the other banks. They don't just consider growth and inflation. Uh, they also need to consider what financial fragmentation is. Uh, so, um, you know, um, I'll just I'll just describe briefly what that means is that, uh, you know, Italy's uh, bond markets are really stressed out. Foreigners are rushing out of Italy's bond markets. So the Italy and Germany bond yield spread has risen to risk territory. Uh, now, the ECB has to address that as well. So, you know, they have to find a way to rescue Italy's bond markets. Uh, we haven't yet heard uh, anything concrete on that. Uh, so that is particularly going to be a limiting factor for the ECB in terms of tightening, um, you know, I mean, July is, of course, the month where they plan to start tightening. Um, and if we don't see any progress on, um, on this uh, anti-fragmentation tool, uh, I think it will be hard to kind of imagine a 50 basis points hike coming from uh, the ECB in July. And uh, given that, you know, I mean, Spanish inflation reported last night was is already touching 10% levels. So um, it's it's going to be, um, so Europe is facing bigger troubles than even US. Um, so moving along, uh, just showing here that there are a variety of risks being faced by the global markets. The financial conditions are tightening. Uh, demand is slowing down. Central banks will likely hike until something breaks, be it the economy or the markets. Um, and from an emerging markets viewpoint, um, what you see in the chart on the right here is we are at the risk of this galloping food crisis, even though food prices have eased uh, recently. Uh, I don't think that threat has gone away completely. Uh, we will discuss that later too. Uh, but overall, I think the, the idea is that climate change and deglobalization trends or food protectionism trends, as I would say, it means that it may remain difficult for at least some of these the smaller frontier markets to source uh, food imports. Uh, this means that uh, there is a rising risk of defaults in emerging markets, especially the smaller frontier markets, something like what we saw in Sri Lanka recently. Uh, so yeah, given that financial conditions are tightening and we are at this risk, I think there's a variety of risks facing the economy, uh, which we need to consider and uh, which will continue to have an impact on the markets in the coming months. Uh, so this is uh, just a chart on financial uh, tightening as well, interest rate hikes versus inflation rate by countries. Uh, this is only a G10 uh, example. So I think the only two outliers that I particularly see here are uh, Japan and Euro. Euro, of course, we've already talked about, and they will be looking at uh, raising uh, rates, um, not at the pace that they should be, but uh, they will be moving ahead with that as well. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the key outlier that I would want to discuss is Japan. Uh, it is fighting to bring back inflation after three decades of deflation. Um, and the Bank of Japan's uh, yield curve control policy, which essentially means that they are trying to um, keep the 10-year yields capped at 0.25%. Uh, that is being repeatedly tested by the markets. 
uh, the other country which is not shown on this chart on the left is of course china which is uh, uh, still easing uh, because credit growth has uh, been lower sharply actually lower because of the result of the pandemic uh, the demand that um, you know this was destroyed because of the pandemic and has continued to uh, you know be seeing seeing the risk of repeated lockdowns um, as well as restrictions on property and the other regulatory crackdowns that we've seen in china uh, overall the economy is very weak and it's an, it's a politically it's a very important year for china they have an, uh, have a key political event at the, at the end of this year i think uh, october or november um and um i mean i i don't particularly think of course that president xi's position has any threats uh, but uh, of course uh, you know all of the members of the ccp will be reelected and what that means is that uh, uh, they want to show a respectable growth rate for this year I'll just go on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, yeah, so just continuing on China. Um, so uh, yeah, because we, I mean, uh, we think that because of this EU end, they they need to show a respectable level of growth. I mean, their target was five and a half percent GDP growth for 2022. So nowhere near achievable. But um, uh, I mean, of course, they don't also want to show a negative growth rate or uh, say a one percent growth rate for the year. So I mean, of course, they're going to target something around two, three percent. Uh, for which now they have to ease. Uh, they are doing uh, targeted easing measures, um, and of course, uh, like I said, the risk of lockdowns still remains. But um, uh, my sense is that though the lockdowns, if at all, will also remain more targeted rather than like completely um, shutting down a city, as we've seen um, in this quarter. Um, um, and since we cannot completely rule out regulatory hassles in China, um, uh, my consideration would be that it is more rewarding uh, to go at, with the direction of China Chinese government's money. You know, when you kind of think about uh, going into Chinese markets, what, what does that mean? Uh, so we expect that uh, the Chinese authorities are uh, highly focused on rolling out infrastructure construction projects um, because, again, they want to kind of revive their growth and it being a politically important year. So there's traditional infrastructure, which is essentially transportation, energy, water conservancy. Uh, there's also new infrastructure. This was a term introduced in December 2018, where uh, you know China is always this leader in new technologies. It may sometimes actually copy things from the US, uh, but it makes it better and higher quality. <laughs> and eventually, the US has to copy it back. So uh, I mean, I, I think innovation and productivity is at the heart of Chinese economy. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's 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 new infrastructure. I think a lot of focus on. Um, innovation and a lot of focus on productivity, uh, but there's also um, hydrogen energy, uh, which is um, kind of a focus on renewable side. Uh, but uh, of course, if you're going into uh, China's markets, like I said, uh, something to be very cautious about it is that anything that starts to get big will start to hurt them. So small is better. When, it's, when it comes to China. Uh, so the other key theme uh, is uh, cyber security. They also have a lot of focus on data security. I mean, that's uh, uh, pretty clear from the kind of regulations that they've had uh, in the tech sector in the past. Uh, so, and, and now they are, of course, like trying to uh, come up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind, trying to support companies that kind of build uh, softwares to enable this uh, data security or, you know, uh, trying to prevent hacking and stuff like that. So again, cybersecurity is probably a key sector to consider when it comes to China. And lastly, uh, I'm not sure of how many of you are aware, but we have these equity theme baskets at Saxo, uh, where we have a list of themes and uh, every theme has about like 20 plus, uh, 20 or so companies uh, uh, relating to that. And um, we've recently introduced this new theme basket as well on China's little giants. Uh, so um, yeah, these are the innovative uh, companies uh, which is again a lot of focus in China. They have a special selection criteria to fit companies in this uh, in this sector. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, th this month, this uh, since you know there's been some announcement on uh, the tech side and China's reopening. This particular theme basket has actually been doing pretty well this month. So yes, China is the least bad option for now, um, as other global equity markets are likely to go down further from here. Uh, Japan 
as I mentioned uh, earlier, is a pain point because of the widening divergence between U.S. Treasury yields and the yields of the Japanese government bonds, which remain gapped. Uh, the market is also testing the BOJ's commitment to uh, this yield curve control policy by driving JGB yields above the tolerance limit. Um, and in fact, not just, um, you know, in the JGB 10-year yields, also in the, you know, the longer term, the 30-year yields and also in the futures markets. Uh, so the market is continuously testing uh, BOJ's uh, commitment. Um, and uh, the yen, uh, of course, has been a lot of focus last few months and it's dropped to a new 24-month low last night as well. Uh, that is hurting the consumer and the businesses. I mean, inflation is rising, uh, but it is mostly energy-driven. Uh, so I think that's that's key to watch. I mean, tomorrow morning we have Tokyo inflation coming out for June, which is usually a leading indicator for their national inflation prints as well. Uh, so my sense is that um, uh, for BOJ's governor Kurora to capitulate, uh, the prompt has to come from the inflation side, not the markets, I guess. The markets can keep testing, uh, and I think he will just keep buying more bonds and stay committed to YCC. So uh, it's a policy um, that was introduced. I mean, I think so Kurora's whole focus has been to uh, revive inflation in Japan uh, and uh, even though it might be energy driven, I mean, if there is some amount of wage pressure coming back, I, I do think that would be uh, the point where he thinks that uh, he has achieved inflation. Um, that was his target. He retires in April 2023. So that will be a very good note to retire on. Uh, so, so again, yeah, like I said, inflation is something very key to watch in Japan. If it goes up to two and a half, three percent as well, it's it's going to really matter to uh, the Japanese markets um, uh, and, uh, you know, the capitulation of the Bank of Japan. That's actually a key risk to watch, not just for investors in Japan, but for global markets. Um, Japan has this huge, huge amounts of foreign assets. Um, it has a host of retail and institutional investors that are exposed to the CN carry trade where they buy, uh, they, they borrow the yen and then a uh, because they get better interest rates outside uh, the Japanese market, they invest in those foreign markets in search of that extra yield, extra liquidity. Um, so if the BOJ does capitulate, we won't just see a big sell-off in GGBs or uh, the stronger yen, uh, but of course, lots and lots of volatility. But the moves will uh, likely reverberate through the entire financial systems because um, you know all of these uh, carry trades will likely be reversed. I mean, if people start to get higher yields in Japan, they would kind of uh, want to just invest uh, there, right? Um, okay, moving along. Um, so, yeah, so I think that kind of uh, concludes uh, my uh, discussion on the macro and the markets, uh, macro side and the market side in terms of US and global. Uh, but now I'm going to just broaden out the discussion a little bit more and talk about this whole new uh, world that we are in where, you know, of course, we are seeing this coordinated sell off between uh, in bonds, in equities this year. So all your 60, 40 portfolios uh, have have been disappointing. They've given the worst, uh, you know, returns since 20, 2008. Uh, but hold on. Okay, my slide says that every market has its opportunities. Uh, so, of course, there have been some options to hide. I don't know how many of us have taken that opportunity, but Brent crude oil has been the best asset class to be exposed to um, this year, even as late as this, this quarter. I mean, recently we've seen some losses, but uh, uh, if you see uh, right at the bottom are equities, which remain the worst performers um, so far this year in H1. So what's so what's really driving uh, this kind of an asset class performance? I mean, of course, I would say these are disruptive trends. Um, I list some of them here, such, such as say deglobalization, where uh, you know um, we are we're in this whole new um, market order now, where countries want to um, keep uh, their goods to their self. Mostly, it's related to food, yes, uh, because they want to feed their populations first before exporting it out. Um, there's uh, also been, uh, because of this Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, there's been uh, this rising military spending. 
uh, this, uh, the other one to talk about is probably climate change, where there's this discussion about, uh, you know, energy security versus the pace of decarbonization, something that I mentioned about, uh, you know, when I talked about Europe is to they're facing this uh, problem is to, uh, of course, they wanted to have regulation and they wanted to move to ESG and stuff. Uh, but now, since Russia is not supplying gas, they don't have any other options, to, you know, instead of just kind of refiring their coal plants. So so that's that's miserable. And uh, so that will lead to some sustained high energy prices. Uh, but at the same time, the focus on ESG, while it has taken uh, some steps back, it's not going to go away. I mean, there are these new age minerals like lithium and nickel, which are an essential part uh, of this ESG uh, move, and that's uh, you know if you, if you if you take say electric vehicles, a lot of these minerals that go into the making of um, ele electric vehicles will still remain extremely relevant, uh, and the traditional um, commodities have a lot of underinvestment in that space, primarily because there was a lot of focus on ESG earlier, and also because the returns on those investments have been underwhelming. So. Um, ESG has been, uh, will again become a focus, I believe. Uh, I think it's about the war and once that settles down, hopefully soon, uh, uh, this, this push for ESG is likely to get revived. Again, probably it won't be the same as it was earlier, but it's not going to die out as well. And lastly, of course, there's been this offline versus online trend where uh, we have a lot of pent up demand coming back into the, um, you know, into the system right now, uh, because of this global reopening borders, opening uh, relaxation in uh, restrictions across the globe. Uh, but uh, this has not just meant uh, pent up demand, it has also meant a lot of changes in consumer behavior. And that's something we uh, saw in the Q1 earnings season. A lot of companies mentioned about uh, the changing consumer behavior, uh, which kind of sometimes hinted that the consumer is weak. Uh, but uh, I think there's enough reason to believe that uh, while some segments may suffer because consumer demand is lagging, overall, the, con the consumer, at least in the US side, is still pretty strong. Um, so. Um, uh, all of these trends are like, uh, you know, uh, are more structural, not cyclical. Uh, trends like offline versus uh, online uh, has like, uh, it has turned around this year and it's meant that, you know, real world assets that have been ignored so far are getting a lot of attention now. And uh, uh, climate change, I mean, like I said, it's more hot as well as more cold. And that led to uh, the wheat crop in India being destroyed because of the heat wave. And uh, we saw a massive rise in wheat prices because of that. Uh, uh, also, I mean, of course, if uh, most of you probably are from Singapore and you've seen the mil the impact that we had uh, from Malaysia, you know, announcing the ban on chicken, which has now been reversed. But that's all is uh, the uh, climate change because of the lack of wheat crop, which could be fed to the chickens. Malaysia was scared about uh, having enough chickens bred, and that's why it stopped exporting chickens to Singapore. Uh, well, uh, having said that, I mean, again, this policy has been reversed, but we do see the risk of these rising food protectionist measures as well in uh, the months to come. And on the right side here in this uh, uh, slide, I show um, the equity theme baskets that I just mentioned earlier. So these are these are Saxo's equity theme baskets. Um, and we see that commodities and defense have been the outperformers this year. Um, commodity outperformance uh, comes despite China being in lockdowns and global slowdown concerns. I mean, we've seen some pullback recently in the commodities basket. Uh, but again, uh, to say that um, it it would be uh, it would come back is I think that's that's our base view and I'll of course come back to that in more details as well later on. Uh, for defense, uh, why is that important, especially with the situation in Ukraine? I mean, um, the, the countries like Germany will rapidly increase military spending in the coming years. and um, Especially all these EU countries have a lot of focus on military spending now. And if all of the EU 27 countries actually uh, kind of raised their military spending to meet the, the NATO guideline of 2% of, of GDP, uh, that would mean a total of um, over 8% growth in uh, the next decade in military uh, industry. Uh, so that's key. Uh, that's a key factor why we think uh, the defense sector will continue to outperform. 
Now let me get back to the commodities space or dig deeper a little bit on that. Uh, we still think crude oil can go high from here. I mean, the key catalysts will be how far the war prolongs and China's reopening, whether that's sustainable or not, and the actual demand destruction that we see because of the tighter liquidity conditions. But for now, I mean, our sense is that um, the anticipated demand destruction uh, that we have uh, sh sh through higher prices and lower growth, uh, you know, because of the rapid increase in interest rates may help to pause the rally. That's what has happened recently. Uh, but the long-term challenge to supply is still there. You know, the IEA has warned that there will be a supply deficit for crude into 2023 as well. Uh, we've seen some, uh, you know, commitments from OPEC plus members about increasing their production targets. Uh, they are sometimes aiming for um, higher production quotas, but they haven't met or what their initial quotas were as well. So um, again, I mean, it's it's possibly hard. They have a, we have an OPEC plus meeting later today, but it's possibly hard to uh, believe that uh, they could bring up production. As a reminder, again, crude oil is still below its 2008 levels uh, when it reached 145 per barrel, $145 per barrel. Um, the other key reason for, um, you know, the, the lack in crude oil supply is, uh, is the the oil majors who have a lot of cash, they're flush with cash, they but they aren't picking up uh, spending because of regulation risks, again, debted by ESG and debted by future demand expectations. Um, so crude futures actually are still trading much lower than the spot prices, suggesting that, you know, in the future, market uh, demand will fall, uh, which of course debtors investments. Uh, so we don't see a balance being achieved, um, even if there is some modest level of demand destruction. I mean, I can't say that won't happen, uh, but it won't be enough to kind of meet the issue that we are seeing on the supply side. And that kind of still make, keeps us optimistic on the crude oil situation in terms of the prices. Uh, talking about industrial metals, mm, uh, they uh, have had a hard time over the second quarter, especially, uh, but with China now announcing that uh, it will uh, relax quarantine, requ uh, quarantine requirements, uh, it does seem like China may be looking at an option to reopen as well. I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I'm probably going too far ahead. Uh, but, uh, you know, even though, I mean, we still, like I said earlier, we still see uh, risk of further lockdowns in China. I think the outlook for infra is still good, you know, given that we have the government focusing on that. Uh, and uh, on the supply side, again, even for industrial metals, uh, you know, from aluminium and copper to nickel, zinc, um, so we, we are seeing supply running at multi-year lows. Um, and this is not a a space where you can easily uh, add on to the supplies, uh, you know, because the demand is there. Uh, so tight supply uh, outlook will continue to push this sector higher as well. Uh, and also, again, key point to consider is that uh, metals play an important role in green energy transformation as well. Like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, lithium, nickel, they go into the manufacturing of EV batteries as well. So even as we remain bullish, I think uh, we're still a bit more cautious uh, on the metal side uh, because of the concerns of global slowdown. Um, you know, it probably, uh, you know, means that um, uh, as we see into H2, as we see concerns of demand destruction picking up, uh, there may be potentially some more downside first to industrial metals before they kind of return to a long-term bullish trends because of the overall supply issues in the sector. So probably just uh, some time to be cautious for now. And um, the last segment would be on um, agriculture commodities. Um, so again, we have seen some respite in uh, agriculture prices uh, recently, but um, we we remain cautious still. I mean, there is still a threat of a global food crisis uh, because of long-term structural trends. What trends are those? Climate change. We've already talked about that. Climate change uh, is like I gave the India example. The heat wave was there and spoiled the crop uh, for wheat. Uh, similarly, even U.S. planting, uh, it's not uh, it's not at the same levels. It's much below its five-year averages. Uh, so, so that's one reason which will, in the in the long run, still continue to push food prices higher. And the second is the rising food protectionism. Again, we've talked about that. It's probably a little bit because of the war, uh, but uh, uh, also, I mean, I think uh, it, it will be. It's, it, it started with the pandemic actually you know where uh, supply chains were disrupted 
uh, and now it is because of the war uh, where people are trying to, you know, most of the countries, at least uh, the emerging markets, are trying to keep their resources to themselves uh, in order to not run in a situation where uh, they, they can't afford to buy back food uh, to feed their populations. So that means we can't yet expect the upside risk to go away. What's crucial is wheat and edible oils. Uh, both are heavily dependent on the situation in Ukraine. Ukraine is a key producer for both of them. So until we see a clear movement in grains stuck in silos in Ukraine, I mean, you know, there it's, it's we are all, almost approaching a time when the next output is going to arrive. So unless we can clear the silos in Ukraine, uh, we don't see the risk going away. Essentially, two catalysts, weather patterns and the situation in Ukraine or the Black Sea corridor, how that develops. Oh, with uh, that, I think this is the last and the most interesting section of the presentation. Um, so with cycle concerns and sentiment pulling hard in different directions, uh, I think uh, uh, we prefer a balanced approach to U.S. equity exposures in portfolios. It's probably best to blend pure equity portfolios. Um, so my sense is that bonds could become relevant again. Uh, in a portfolio, if um, in H2, if we continue to see these trends of high inflation and demand destruction fears, uh, overall, we still do see a commodity uh, super cycle because, you know, there is rising physical demand and tightening supply. There's increased demand for real assets. Um, there's heightened inflation risk. There's ESG. Uh, so all of that means that supply demand imbalances will take years to kind of uh, correct. Um, and uh, so commodities, of course, remain a very good option for diversification, uh, but also potentially uh, worth considering would be geographic diversification. That's the last part I have. Uh, so, uh, I mean, since we are here in Asia uh, today, I think probably important to mention about uh, diversification in India. And I do see a lot of potential uh, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and of course, India as well. But that being said, that doesn't mean that uh, these markets will not see the downsides. Uh, global tightening will, of course, have an impact on these markets as well. Uh, but but these are some of the options probably you can consider to have that long-term growth in your portfolios as well. Uh, some of our other, I think, ideas would be to stay long inflation. So I think uh, REITs as well are a good play when uh, you are in an inflationary environment. Um, but again, you have to kind of watch out for REITs that have a manageable debt load. And uh, possibly it's a good idea to stay defensive. So uh, consider probably consumer staples, utilities, healthcare. These are the key defensive sectors. And uh, but again, I mean, I think I would reiterate here that you know, the key to remember is that uh, these periods of panic, which are likely to build into H2, uh, uh, can provide the best opportunities for long-term investors. So it's always a good idea to add quality stocks to your portfolio in bear markets. Uh, what is a quality stock? I often get asked that question as well. Uh, so I would look at consistent cash flows, reliable profit margins, and manageable debt levels. Um, so I think um, if, if you think we are probably, you know, going down further in the equity markets and you think it's probably the right time to add some of those quality names, which will give you the best returns in the long run as well. And uh, just on the final slide, these are the key investment themes that we have at Saxo. Um, I'll not talk a lot here, but, uh, you know, I think, again, I would just reiterate, we remain overweight commodities, defense, logistics, cybersecurity, and India, particularly. Um, also, if you're considering mega caps, like I mentioned about the quality stocks, I think it's important to look for pricing power and innovation. Um, if you're considering, uh, say, semiconductors, it's obviously been a sector which has seen a lot of pressure because of the supply issues, but uh, there's practically nothing that will be made without semiconductors, you know. So, uh, but again, the key to focus here is uh, you have to be, uh, you know, the PCs, of course, tablets, PCs, mobile phones as well are kind of seeing slowing demand. Uh, but but uh, chips that can be used in advanced technologies um, um, will will of course uh, be be important. And you know, once the supply side issues are resolved, I think these will continue to be very interesting. And I'll stop there, just well in time to open up the floor for some questions.
Okay, I have a question uh, which says, unlike other inflationary cycles, the cycle leads to an increase in pricing pressures across all categories rather than one single category driving it. Um, are we heading towards times where 5 to 6% inflation is an acceptable norm and central banks learn to accept the same? I'm glad someone asked that question. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do think that uh, inflation is a runaway train and central banks will keep trying to catch it, keep trying to catch it. It will hurt the economy some way or the other into the next year but uh, uh, you I think it's it's very right to say that uh, it's not just a cyclical upside pressure that we are seeing on inflation we are actually seeing structural changes structural pressures uh, coming from the, the under investment in the real physical world and uh, that certainly means that um, uh, you know even with the Fed uh, uh, hiking to a point where demand starts to get, uh, you know, destroyed. It is the, it is a market which is not going to come back in balance pretty quickly, and so central banks will have to, at the cost of the economy, learn to accept inflation levels which have been considerably higher than uh, what we've seen in the past. I mean, I don't think we are going back to the two percent inflation levels um, in the in the next few years. It's uh, it's something that central banks will need to accept and understand. Okay, um, I have another question on um, Asia, which is very interesting. What are some of the most resilient markets in Asia to consider? So um, I had some on my slides here uh, earlier, but I think uh, I would just stress upon um, two or three of them okay uh, so india of course is interesting as a as a as a great alternative to china you know some of the investors of course want to stay away from china now because of the uh, risk of regulations uh, so india kind of provides the um, you know it's it, there's a government which is um, business not not as business friendly i would say but it is uh, more uh, you know at least uh, from a regulate from a regulatory standpoint it is uh, probably more predictable uh, than what the china uh, government is uh, so it offers a, a brilliant alternative uh, but i think uh, my my optimism actually is uh, potentially bigger on Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam actually started to see a lot of uh, interest um, after you know the Trump tariffs kind of made uh, manufacturing uh, start to move out of China. Uh, so Vietnam was um, considered as a very interesting alternative at that point. And uh, um, sorry, yeah, so Vietnam uh, has been interesting because of the rising manufacturing and uh, uh, what that uh, means is that, um, uh, you know, their exports, if you look at their exports, I think um, they're growing at like 20% levels despite these concerns of a global slowdown. Um, and not just that, they are actually, uh, you know, uh, doing well domestically as well. Uh, since at least after COVID has retreated, they've reopened the economy and uh, consumption has picked up in a big way. So they actually just reported yesterday the GDP numbers at Kyoto GDP was about 7.7%. 7, 7%, and that's after 5% in Q1. Uh, so, of course, uh, I think I'm, I'm quite optimistic on Vietnam. But again, I'm probably a word of caution. I don't think... Uh, you know, I'm not saying that short term there won't be pressures. Of course, with the Fed tightening, all of the EMs see some, some amount of risk uh, in terms of capital outflows. I mean, this 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 time around, uh, the EMs are much better prepared uh, to face the Fed's tightening compared to say 2012, 2013. Uh, the balance sheets are much stronger. FX reserves are uh, much more significant. Uh, so that does mean that they can weather uh, these uh, tightening risks much better. But that again doesn't mean that they they won't face downturns. They will. Uh, inflation as well has been much better controlled. Even for Vietnam, inflation is under 4%. It will again rise further from here. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we, I'm not kind of looking at inflation prints of about 8 to 10%, what we're seeing in the West. And for Vietnam, again, another key factor to consider is that it is a food exporter. So that, again, limits the risks of a lot of the risks that we are seeing uh, in uh, a lot of the risks that we are seeing in um, 
so yeah, so I think a lot of the risk that we're seeing in the emerging markets is basically coming from um, uh, food prices and energy prices. And uh, at least for Vietnam, at least food prices is not such a big risk because they are, they are an exporter. Uh, so Vietnam is good. Indonesia uh, as well. I think Indonesia is interesting uh, because um, I mean, I think that's the only market that's been up in Asia year to date. Um, and that's uh, potentially because uh, we've seen uh, uh, that they have a lot of natural resources as well. Uh, a lot of uh, they're a big uh, exporter of nickel and stuff. And like I said, you know, EVs need that as well. Uh, and, and a lot of these EV companies are now trying to move their manufacturing closer to these lithium mines and nickel, you know, mining areas. And so, of course, Indonesia has been considered as a potential uh, for that. And Indonesia is also has, you know, has a lot of uh, these business friendly policies. Uh, so, so that kind of really helps these countries to gain some more momentum. Or what are some of the companies um, in the defense basket? Um, okay, so I think on that question, I would probably, um, you know, ask you to go into the platform. Uh, if you have the Saxo uh, app, you can go into that. Uh, you can go into research, and we have equity theme baskets there. If you click on the defense basket, you will be able to see uh, some of our, the companies that uh, we mentioned about the. Uh, on the defense side or actually any of the uh, sectors that you might be interested any of those themes that you might be interested in um okay there's a question about the mega caps is at the top of the triangle what does that mean it doesn't really mean anything i probably used the wrong uh, um you know i probably used the wrong uh, smart art that i should be using but it's just kind of to summarize um uh, the fact that uh, i mean so those are the key themes that we have and i think mega caps is um is always very interesting to clients um, they always want to get into some of the key names um, you know, amazons and microsofts and stuff like that um and they always uh, want to kind of time the market to be able to get into those uh, key stocks. Uh, well, I mean, of course, what I would obviously you know, talk to clients about is that uh, it's it's uh, never a good idea to kind of try to time the markets. And I think, especially when we are in bear markets, uh, I think a dollar cost averaging is a very interesting strategy, uh, which you could uh, look at. What that means is that, um, uh, you uh, you continue to buy at lower and lower prices. So after you buy, if the stock goes down further, you buy at even lower prices. So that means that uh, you know your overall cost of uh, buying the stock goes down. The average cost goes down. Uh, so so uh, I mean, if there are these key quality stocks that you believe will turn around uh, when the overall cycle turns, when the liquidity taps open up again, uh, then it is probably a good idea to consider uh, those stocks. Uh, but it's it, it doesn't mean, I mean, mega caps being at the top of the triangle doesn't mean that uh, we, uh, we look at them any differently than any of our other themes. Okay. Um, I have this other question about uh, why is Saxo so optimistic about India? I mean, I, I would say, uh, I mean, um, you know, of course, India um, is, like I said, a very interesting market because of its favorable demographics, because of rapid urbanization and digitization. Um, and like I said, the regulatory oversight in India is far more predictable and more consistent uh, than possibly, you know, so I'm, I'm just comparing it to China, which, which is where most of the investors are facing that challenge of uh, the uncertainty of regulatory oversight. Uh, so of, of course, India has its challenges and, you know, uh, but if we do uh, see it from a business uh, friendly point of view, I think uh, the policies are uh, more business friendly. And if we do see some progress on say, uh, some of the key reforms such as, you know, land and labor reforms, that kind of, again, helps uh, to improve the business climate further. 
I mean, inflation is such a big problem in India. I should not deny that. And it's not now. It's been there for three years. Um, and Reserve Bank of India has also been kind of quite delayed in accepting inflation as a problem and has only started tightening now, uh, which again, of course, means they will have to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there will be short term pain in the markets. Uh, but uh, I think uh, overall, I uh, I see that focus on manufacturing, on uh, urbanization, Organization on uh, there's a lot it's a vast amount of untapped potential in India um, and there's like this huge uh, potential to broaden the use of digital technologies so uh, once that global um, tightening uh, situation uh, kind of starts to settle down a bit I think there is bound to be a lot more interest in India as well and that's going to be uh, in terms of the return potential I do see uh, a lot of uh, return potential in the medium to long term from India. Okay so, um, since we are kind of close to uh, running out of time now I think I will just uh, uh, like to thank everybody for listening in and uh, with that I pass it on pass it back to Kelly. Thank you. So thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, for clients with dedicated relationship managers and sales traders, please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to have more in-depth one-on-one discussion with Charu. So with that, thank you and have a great evening.